Hello, and welcome to my webinar on protecting users and their data with interbase encryption and user management. My name is Mary Kelly. I'm a software consultant at Embarcadero Technologies. I'm an interbase enthusiast and developer who's been using interbase since my beginnings in the world of databases. You can reach out to me with any questions or comments at mary.kelly at embarcadero.com. Our agenda today will cover some basics on why we need to keep users' data safe and the ways that Interbase can help you to keep data safe and secure. Databases are vital in today's organizations. We live in a very data-driven society where data is really everywhere you turn, collecting more and more information about the backbone to companies. They manage customers, employees, transactions, financial data, and even more. And as application or database developers, DBAs, security officers, it's really part of the responsibility to make sure that this technology that everyone relies so heavily upon is protected from malicious, unauthorized access. It's really a never-ending process of regulations, policies, and laws that are heavily enforced by every industry and country. And when it comes to protecting or preventing unauthorized use of consumers' data, those rules and regulations can get quite severe in how they're handled. With HIPAA, which sets boundaries for the release of electronic health records, if you're found non-compliant for neglect or from a breach, those violations alone can cost up to $1.5 million per year if they're not corrected within a certain time period. There are, of course, other costs associated, such as the cost of having to properly identify the regulatory committees, as well as having to find ways to communicate with all of your customers. Emails may be a dedicated site for responses or perhaps just an influx of customers that hit the servers all at once to change passwords or alter data in an attempt to further protect themselves. Now, beyond the cost of fines that affect organizations, the damage to the reputation of a company who fails to protect personal data can take years to build back up if it's even possible at all, which is why we have to choose the best ways to go about protecting users' data. It's far more important now. Consumers have every right to feel panic and fear when they see data breaches, and this has led to hesitancy in trusting brands and less of a desire to share personal information. But maybe it's not just consumer information that gets stolen but in organizations, business operations, and information that it has been compromised as well. Having to bring in consultants, run tests, and work with security vendors as well as lawyers can have a huge impact on any company that's dealing with security. Now, some of the challenges that come with database security, especially as we've moved to cloud and mobile storage solutions include needing to consider where the data is located. If it's on a LAN, is it located on a removable disk as a backup? Maybe you're producing mobile apps with embedded solutions. The location of data will determine the type of processes and measures that you need to use to secure that information. Organizations have to make sure that they have appropriate security measures in place on PCs, smartphones, and other devices that will be accessing the stored data. And this can be a huge challenge as these endpoints, particularly mobile devices, can otherwise be a weak point in an organization's security defenses. If you're managing that data security, do you have over the wire or on disk encryption? Now one must have is to have a role-based access control for secure data storage. The more you limit permissions and privileges to people, the better you will be able to protect your users. With analytics, we are so much more aware than ever of the value of data. But in order for data to prove useful, enterprises need the ability to ensure the veracity of their data. 
and that means investing in security. The challenge here can come in the form of too much data or perhaps duplication of data, compliance issues, especially when we look at contact information. Contact info rarely stays the same for extended periods of time. People move, they change their names, and this can result sometimes in duplicates or obsolete data. And from a security standpoint, Without that constant verification, you could be leaving yourself open to unauthorized individuals gaining access to confidential information, all because of a simple miscommunication. And of course, confidentiality and privacy. What data can be considered public and what's the level of value for each of our data classifications? We know the difference between public knowledge and highly sensitive data, like social security numbers or credit card numbers. And we know that every system or solution can have vulnerabilities, leading to privacy threats. So privacy and integrity of our data, once it's been entered, can be a huge challenge with fully implementing security plans. And understanding or being able to identify that sensitive and critical data compared to public knowledge will help you determine what resources and time are needed to focus your security efforts. Interbase supports several ways to encrypt data and protect your end users. You have role-based user security. You're able to specify what information is encrypted within the database and at the column level as well. You have a separate security officer using communication between servers and clients with over the wire network traffic security, and you can encrypt your backup files that may be stored for historical records. Now let's take a look at each of these a little bit more. In general, Security for Interbase relies on a central security database for each server host. Now this database called admin.ib by default contains a record for each legitimate user who has permission to connect to the databases and Interbase services on that host server. Each record includes the user's login name and the associated encrypted password. The entries in this security database apply to all databases on that server. User security is a very important yet complicated topic in database security, and a large majority of applications that store data need to have different levels of access to that data, and while you're building those requirements for your solution, you have to determine who should be seeing what data in your database. Interbase security can either be embedded inside the database or you can use the admin.ib file. By using admin.ib, it can run across multiple databases. And if you want this security to be specific to one database that will be on a mobile device, then you can use the embeddable version of Interbase where the security table is actually inside the database. Now, like I said, this is especially useful for mobile devices as the database won't be accessible outside of the application accessing the credentials. Now you can always set up user security on every individual user. Say you have access to update this table and that table, or since you're in this management role, you can see the number of logged hours by your employees. But by creating and defining roles, then having users grouped into those roles it makes it a lot easier to manage your database security because of boundaries set for that role and the time saving for your IT department. They won't have access rights to roles other than the ones assigned to them, which again makes it easy to add or remove access to data across your system. From within IB console, I can click on roles and you can see here I've already created a role called sensitive. Now this role, if I double click and click on the properties, I can also see the permissions. Now permissions on show the users that I currently have assigned and permissions for shows the procedures, tables, and views that I currently have permission for the sensitive role. I can go through and add procedures or tables, perhaps access to the project table 
and be able to choose the offerings as well there. So select and delete or perhaps insert and provide those actions to this role. The same thing can also be done in, in iSQL where I can go through and grant select on employee to this group called sensitive. And now if I go back through, I can just visually see that one of the permissions is that the employee table now has a select option as well. So that's pretty easy to start setting up roles and I highly recommend using them for any larger user bases. In Interbase, there are a few key players that you need to be aware of. You have the database owner, which in some cases might be the SysDBA, who can grant access and is basically your administrative Interbase user with exclusive rights. Now only the SysDBA user can update the security database to add, delete, or modify user configurations. SysDBA can use either GSEC or IB Console to authorize a new user by assigning a username and password. The second user to be aware of is the SysDSO, which is your system data security officer, similar to the SysDBA. Only the SysDSO is the system data security officer and owns the responsibility for most encryption related activities. There is, by design, a separation of power between the database owner and the SysDSO, which is designed to help facilitate secure practices. The SysDSO role controls three significant steps in the encryption process, including creating an SEP, or System Encryption Password, creating the encryption keys, and granting the database owner access to the encryption keys, which they then use to encrypt the database or the columns. However, the SysDSO user cannot encrypt the database or columns themselves, nor can they grant or revoke access to an encrypted database. Only a database owner or an individual table owner can actually encrypt a database or columns in a database. The SysDSO simply creates the tools, those encryption keys, that are needed to perform the encryption, requiring that multiple users set up and, and implement encryption rather than just one person holding all that power, adds an additional layer of database security. Using role-based security and having a separate security officer in combination with our next topic, Interbase Encryption, provides a solid foundation for protecting your users and their data. Interbase Encryption is built into the database as part of its cross-platform single file format, allowing Interbase to offer protection for your data everywhere that it's located throughout the entire software development lifecycle on whatever the device. Since it's the same database file that you're using on the server that you use then with your iOS and Android devices, that encryption moves with you on the server or IB to go. Interbase has support for both the AES and DES encryption algorithms. With DES, you get 56-bit weak encryption and with AES, you get 128, 192, and 256-bit levels of AES encryption. Now, both are built into the Interbase license, so out of the box, you can set up an encrypted database with, without a lot of hassle. Interbase has two levels of encryption, database and column level encryption. For database level encryption, Interbase encrypts all of the database pages that have user-related information. Non-user database pages are not encrypted, and that includes the header page, log, and inventory pages. With column level encryption, you can be far more specific and flexible. When you encrypt a column, you can specify the table that contains the column, then choose to either encrypt all of the columns in that table or only columns that you specifically need encrypted. 
For example, if in your database you have an employee table with a payroll column that both the payroll and human resources roles need to have access to, where you might have social security numbers that are associated in that table, your human resources users don't need access to that data, but payroll specifically does. You can encrypt that social security column so that only your payroll employees or the users who need access to that data in that encrypted column can be given decrypt privileges for that column. Now let's take a look at encrypting and creating the DSO user in action. So we've made sure that the server is running and today we'll be using the a Northwind database that I'll go through and encrypt. So we can right click on the properties and under the general tab, we can choose embedded user authentication and enable that. The EUA will be set to active as true and click OK. And this now gives us the ability to go through and encrypt our database. So now if we right click on the database again, we can click on encrypt database and it opens up this wizard for us, provides some steps that we'll be taking to create the encryption protocol that we'll be using. It also allows us to create that SysDSO user as well. The first step will be creating the password for the SysDSO user, and we'll just create a generic password here. Yours can be whatever password that you choose. We'll create the encryption password. So this is going to be that SEP or system encryption password. Click on next. In this step three, we now create the encryption name. So we will say Northwind encrypt as our encryption name. We can then choose to either enable case sensitivity and also provide grant options. We can also choose to make this the default key for all encryption. Next, we have options where we can choose which protocol we're looking to use. We'll use AES, and from there, we get access to that 256-bit encryption. I'll make my init vector and padding random, so this just allows for there to be extra characters that get added at the end so it prevents hackers from being able to decipher the names. Click next and we can choose the backup key name. The backup key name is going to be very important. This is the key name that you will use along with the password to both backup and restore any encrypted databases. We'll go into this shortly, but we'll create this backup key. We'll just call it backup Northwind and provide a password. Click OK. And the database has now been encrypted at database level encryption. So we've created the SysDSO user and encrypted the database. Now clicking into the tables, we can choose to open up the table editor and under the properties, we can alter those tables. And you now see that a field has been added to the columns. And this field allows us to determine whether or not a specific field will require the encryption key to be able to decrypt it. So perhaps with this information, we need to encrypt the address of the users. We can go through and we've now been given the option to include an encryption value as well. So we'll use the Northwind encrypt here and we can also choose a decrypt default if we want to. Click OK and this field has now been encrypted. Now, if we go back into our tables, we can go to table permission, and I've already created a role called generic data. And the current member here is MTK, one of my users. And we can take a look at the permissions that are provided currently for this role. 
Now we just went through and altered the customers. So we'll make sure that the address can be decrypted for generic data that MTK is currently a member of. So when we go into iSQL and we connect to the database as this user, when we select everything from customers, we can see that the database has decrypted the address for the user MTK. So we could very easily go back in and create new users or alter our users and their permissions directly from within IB console. When you encrypt data at the database and column level, you are still vulnerable to attacks over the transmission process. Now to ensure that your data is fully protected, Interbase has the wire network encryption or SSL network encryption. Over the wire encryption allows for the data as well as commands to be encrypted between your servers and clients. This is important if you're concerned about someone seeing the communication and increasing concern as organizations become more dispersed geographically and allow access from unsecure networks. Data transmitted across those networks is susceptible to sniffing attacks and other malicious intentions. Before setting up the over-the-wire encryption on the server or client side, you first need to obtain the necessary certificates for security provided by a certificate authority. Now, Interbase uses these certificates to verify identity information similar to a web app that has a secure digital certificate. Over the wire requires that you generate two certificates, a public key certificate for the server and a server private key. So these can just be two PEM files that you download. You can use any SSL tool to generate these certificates or contact your IT department or CA vendor. And to learn more about how to create SSL certificates using OpenSSL, you can check out the website at openssl.org or here at the bottom of this slide. Once you have your PEM files, you can walk through IB consoles over the wire wizard to complete your SSL network encryption. In Interbase, click server and OTW configuration to open the wizard. There, you'll see it's not too hard to initially set it up at the port, client, and server certificates, and you're almost ready to go. For more information, again, on setting up the client and server for over-the-wire encryption with OpenSSL and to see some sample configurations that enable and, and implement over-the-wire encryption across the network, I recommend looking at the Interbase Doc Wiki where you can find additional notes and links for the use of SSL encryption. Encrypted backup files. We go through all the trouble of making sure, or at least hoping, that our databases are secure as possible, but what happens to the backups? In a lot of cases, they may just be sitting there on a local disk, a shared network, a warehouse, maybe you're holding them in a storage cloud somewhere else, but no matter where they are, what happens if someone gets a hold of them? They can easily go out there and restore the database to a server where they then have some permissions and, oh no, because of all the data that we work so hard to secure, it's theirs. To maintain the confidentiality of your encrypted database, you must create encrypted backup files. Encrypting your database backup files just means that you're taking the security protocols one step further. In Interbase, we have built into our GBAC functionality this database backup encryption. GBAC is a command line utility that's used to perform your database backups and restores with a few different options depending on your requirements. To perform an encrypted database backup or restore using GBAC, here are some examples of that code. Dash B is for backup and dash R is for restore. Then you add the database location, the new name of your database backup file or files. You're gonna take that system encryption password 
that was created by the SysDSO, the encrypt or decrypt switch, and the backup key password. The encrypting and decrypting process can also be handled with the Interbase GUI IB console by a database owner, and it uses a visual wizard to walk through your database backup and restoration. Now let's take a look at a backup script and some of those options to secure your end user's data. Now that we've encrypted our database, we need to have a backup plan in place. Now my database is located in my C data drive, so what we're going to do is back up that file into this backup directory using a script that I've already written out. Now this is just a simple backup batch file that I have sitting on the desktop so that I can fi easily find it. And basically to back up this database, we're just going to change the location to where the GBAC directory is located. And then we'll run the gbac.exe backup with output of the database file that we are backing up, the location as well as the name of that backup file, the SEP encryption, simple easy encrypt, the backup key that we created as well, the username that I'll be using to back up in this case my sysdba with the master key password, as well as the service manager. From here we can run the backup.batch file where we now see that the database has been successfully backed up. Now we can double check that in our backup folder and we can see that our Northwind encryption database has been backed up. Now this database is now able to be restored and you can do the same using IB console as well. You'll be able to go in through IB console and go to backup and restore. You can also follow the same practice if you wish to back up via IB console or restore the database at any point as well. You can choose to, within the options, either restore the type with a create database or you can also replace a database. If you are planning to replace the database, then you will need to supply the SEP password as well as the decrypt password and EUA username and password. And that is how you can backup and restore your encrypted Interbase databases. With Interbase, it's very easy to set up these security measures. Here are the steps used to encrypt your databases and columns along with access privileges in Interbase. First, ensure that the embedded user authentication or EUA is enabled on your selected database. This step will be performed by your database owner or sysdba. Then your database owner will want to create the sysdso user, your data security officer or owner. Steps three through five where you would create your SEP and encryption keys and then grant the database owner with encryption privileges are all performed by the security owner, not by that database owner. Now your DSO has granted the encryption access, so the database owner can now take over and they have the ability to encrypt the database and the columns and then also grant or revoke privileges to other users or roles based on your organization's access requirements. Thanks again for joining this webinar on protecting users and their data with interbase encryption and user management. Now for any questions you might have on interbase encryption. Okay, fantastic. So any questions you have, put them in the question panel and I'll share with Mary Michael and she will, sorry, Mary Kelly, and she will answer them for you. My apologies, Mary Kelly. I have a friend named Mary Michael. And for some reason, my brain just totally swapped you out there. Oh, it's fine. Um, I shortened my name to Mary. My name's actually Mary Teresa, but everyone does the exact same thing. I've been called every Mary something on, you know, in the book. So I'm quite used to it. Okay, well, <laughs> so is it Mary Teresa Kelly then would be your? 
It is. Yeah. My first name is Mary Teresa and I don't have a middle name. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. Very, <laughs> uh, yeah. My, my parents chose a very, uh, like Irish Catholic name there. You'd go MTK. Yes. Yeah. That's actually, I think, how everyone sees me um, on LinkedIn. It's MT and then Kelly is my last name. So. Okay. I, uh, my, one of my sons is named Timothy Joseph Aaron McKees and he goes by TJ, but then everybody, you know, if it's like a official thing, then they see his name is Timothy. And so they frequently will call him Timothy. Yeah, but he, he's always we we named him that so we could name him TJ. So oh, gotcha. Well, TJ is a pretty cool name, so yeah. it's nice to have uh, you know kind of that shortens name where you can just do initials because you know I think there's some coolness to it there. There is, there is, and he would when he was very young he was very adamant that his name is TJ. It is not Timothy. It is not Tim. It's TJ because that's what we always called him. Um. Uh, so here's a question here from Don. He goes, do IB Light and IB to go have the same encryption features? No. So that's a great question. IB Light is light for a reason. Um, it does not actually have any encryption features built into it. So if you are looking for encryption, go with IB to go. So the uh, that's the main difference between the two, right? IB Light and IB to go is the lack of encryption features yeah so the three well the biggest differentiators between ib light and ib to go is of course the no encryption and then the other biggest thing is that you also have a file a database file size limit so anything over 100 megabytes will will not record to the database so if you're looking for an application if you have an application where you will have to make transactions then IB to go is really going to be the the best option available to you. Uh, if you back up, if you back up on one ODS level, can you restore to an older version of Interbase ODS with an encrypted database? So if the ODS level that you're backing up to is the same ODS level that you have on your current Interbase version. So for instance, if you're using Interbase 2020, but your ODS is 15.0, then you could back up and restore to a XE7 database uh, server, but you can't go, um, but Interbase needs to know what those on disk structures are. So if you have an older version, you can back up and restore to a newer version. But when it goes backwards, um, you just have to make sure that that on-disk structure is going to be available in the previous version. Okay, I tried to summarize that. <laughs> Alan, hopefully you uh, understood what Mary said. I, I, I was able to follow you, but then when I tried to type it, it's like, this is not coming out. I'm summarizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, like I said, you can kind of, it's, we have kind of backwards capabilities with backups and restores, but you just have to make sure that the ODS that you're using um, in the newer versions of Interbase, like Interbase 2020, the default ODS is 18. So any database that's backed up and restored, you know, kind of or created on an Interbase 2020 version will have that 18.0 structure. If you try to back that up and then put it on like an Interbase 7 database, it won't understand that ODS because that's way too high for the level. But if you go down to, you know, like I said, 15 for your ODS, then you can put that on an Interbase XE7 version of the server. So it's it, it doesn't, it can be a little confusing, but if you just remember that the numbers have to match, then it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, I think I followed that. And Alan said that was, yep, he totally followed you. So. Okay, awesome.
So Don's asking encryption differences between IB 2020 production server versus development server. Uh, so if you want to do encryption, um, specifically encryption, not all of the features that I spoke about, if you're wanting to be able to do like the SEP and things like that, you will have to have a production or a license for Interbase. So uh, you'll otherwise receive a error that says that it can't, um, it, it doesn't have a strong encryption, which is kind of built into Interbase servers anyway. Um, so that's gonna be the biggest difference is you won't be able to actually perform those backups um, or even encrypt the database overall with that database and column level encryption. So that, those are the biggest differences. So the, the developer server is not a full production server then essentially? No, no, it's not. Um, and it, it's again, kind of designed to be the development. So building out the database and kind of getting a feel for how Interbase works and then setting up that production server or that licensed server. Uh, and you can, you can actually just go out and get one of the like servers with a single user if you want to actually be able to work on encryption before putting a database out there in production, and then of course be able to scale from there with additional users. Um, and that that's probably gonna be the easiest way to actually start with encryption in Interbase. Yeah. yeah. So those things that you have, it's some might not realize that the uh, developer server's not the full server. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> not, always, yeah. not always clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can you can actually well I should say too you don't even necessarily have to buy the server you could also download a server trial and you'd and you'd also be able to work with encryption on that so the server trial has all of those capabilities built in that the normal server would um, it just has like a ninety day limit and then after that of course you know you'll you'll get a call from from your account manager to say, hey, you know, how much are you using Interbase and are you interested in actually getting yourself a license? So go out there and get a server trial and you can test around with Interbase as well. Okay. Uh, question here, a database with uh, EUA enabled has the user ID passwords inside it and a database without EUA has the user ID and passwords in admin.ib. Does it follow that an IB to go database has the same structure as a server database with AES enabled? Uh, let me let me break down that question uh, or both of those questions a little bit. So for the first portion, a database with the EUA enabled, um, yeah, it's going to have within the database. So if you remember in the video where I was showing the users specifically, those users will have to be inside that database specifically to be able to access the server. If you take EUA, uh, not the embedded user authentication, the first section, but the EUA active, if you make that false um, or no, then you'll be able to actually access the admin.ib. So that part correct there. Um, with IB to go, it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually give you an option to have the database outside or have that authentication outside of the server. So um, not specifically with AES enabled, but with EUA enabled, the answer would be yes, if that makes sense. So yeah, ib to go needs to have the EUA enabled specifically because the database won't be connecting to a server somewhere else and then authenticating that user and responding back, it will be if your username and password are in the database, then you can access everything moving forward. If it's not, you have no access. And I hope that's uh, I hope that answers your question, James. Yeah, uh, typo, he meant EUA, yeah. not AES. Okay. okay, then yes, yeah, then that's the answer. Okay, all right. Yeah. Sounds like you got it then. I, I, I thought that might be what he meant, but I didn't want to make an assumption because it was a very specific yeah. question. 
Yes, it is. Definitely. I was like, yes. Okay. Let me, let me see. Cause remember the, um, the AES encryption is part of the actual encrypting of the database and turning on the embedded user authentication and the EUA active are before you actually go to encrypt the database. It's just sort of saying, do you have permission to encrypt the database instead of here is how you encrypt the database. So it's kind of a, a, multi-step process um, to actually enable encryption because we want to make sure that if you want to encrypt your database, you're doing it with purpose. So <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. Yeah, probably so. I, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of securing data because obviously, you know, I'm a consumer as well. We all are. So the idea of, you know, keeping data safe and making sure that everything is done with reason um is is kind of a big part to to my you know talks you know i originally took an interest in cryptography just from a um i just thought it was a fascinating topic but over okay. time you know like the same as you, you're saying though i you know become more aware of the importance of encrypting data even if you don't think the you have anything to hide as it were right mm -hmm. <laughs> It is becoming more and more important that you encrypt everything, especially anytime you have other people's data, really. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, I mean, I would I would hate to be in a situation where, you know, someone's taken even, like, my email address. You know, if I type in my email address somewhere, I'm like, I don't want to get all that spam because, yeah. you know, Google, Google filters are only so good, you know, as they know what's happening. But, yeah, in, in a lot of situations, it might even, you know, be the city that you live in or something, and, if you don't feel comfortable having that information out there, then, you know, it's not like you can't put that data out there. You know, if you are signing up for something, they need to know where you're located and other things like that for tax purposes, maybe, or just so that they can ship you the uh, proper stuff. And in a lot of situations, you know, if that data is out there and available to somebody, that's that's kind of you know like a daunting anxiety driving fear that i think a lot of people have <laughs> yeah all right well i think that we've gotten through the questions here thanks again for another fantastic session on interbase mary kelly of course i always feel i feel weird calling you or calling you just mary <laughs> yeah i uh I, I get that a lot actually. You're you're not the first person to tell me that. They're like, should I call you Mary? Should I call you either that or that because I have three first names, it's either Mary or Teresa or Kelly as my first name. So mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I, I take whatever people wanna wanna call me in, you know, any sense of my name. So awesome. I used to work for a company called MK actually, so Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Morrison Knudsen was the they shortened it to NK. Cool. Well, you know, with complicated names again, it's it's a necessity. Yeah. All right. Well, take care, and I will catch up with you on the next dinner base uh, webinar. Yes. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and good luck with your interbase deployments and keeping your data secure and your users safe. <laughs>